Good morning. Welcome to this time of worship and afterwards fellowship. My name is Bob Zirkel. Still has not changed. Uh, please take time to fill out the communication and prayer form in your bulletin. Prayers will be lifted up today and throughout the week through our prayer chain. So please take time to do that. You're welcome to make use of our family worship room just outside the sanctuary. Um, also, I want to thank those who provided treats today and uh, anyone who, who took time to greet today. I appreciate that as well. Please join us for refreshments after worship in the East Room. Do we have any announcements this morning? Uh, looking at your bulletin, uh, we have uh, committee reports are due to me via email by October 8th. Our um, executive meeting is Thursday, October 11th. Uh, let's see, anything else? Does anybody have anything else? I have a special announcement. Sunday, October 14th, is our quarterly meeting, followed by <laughs> Italiano potluck. Bring a your favorite dish uh, for you, carb watchers. Bring a salad or something, or a meat a dish. That is the quickest costume change ever. Thank you. Woo. Anything else? All right, let's, uh, let's open in prayer then. Father, thank you for bringing us here today. It's through your grace that we are all able to gather this morning and to worship and praise you as we should because you are always there for us through good times, through bad, and let us remember that. Also, Father, let us pray for our country. We need your help desperately. Also pray that we open our hearts and our minds to Pastor's message this morning. Let us sit still and let you move. We ask this in your name. Amen. All right, our opening hymn is Number 495, My Faith Has Found a Resting Place. Please join me.
We'll continue with our call to worship. God's grace is more than adequate for these times in which we now find ourselves living. Even as we all grow older, we are learning day by day to keep our minds centered on Christ. When we do, the worries and anxieties and concerns of the world pass away and nothing but perfect peace is left in the human heart. When God's love fills a heart, it occupies every single part of it with the fruit of the Spirit. His perfect peace leaves no room for fear in the heart of the believer. It's first John verse I'm sorry, chapter four, verse eighteen. Go ahead and have a seat. Uh, this morning, is there anyone who would like to share anything with us, a testimony or a blessing this week? If, if there is anyone, please just step up. We have one. Pastor always talks about blessings, and sometimes we have great miracles, and other times we just have small ones, but a miracle is a miracle, a blessing is a blessing, and I just wanted to share mine with you. I happened to be down in my basement looking through boxes for fall decorations and things, and my neighbor came down from upstairs. She was washing clothes, and I said to her, you know, I've got to contact our landlord because when I moved in, he told me there was hookups for washer and dryer, and boy, I can't find any, and I used to be married to a plumber, so I think I know what they look like. But anyway, um, she said, well, good luck with that. <laughs> so we chatted for a little bit, and uh, she had her uh, boyfriend come down and help me carry some boxes upstairs, which was a, a big help. But I was then going through the boxes and looking through what I had and throwing out stuff I didn't need, and I got a text from her, and she said, you shouldn't have to haul laundry out to the laundromat or to your mother's or wherever you need to do laundry. Please use my washer and dryer whenever you feel like it. And I thought that was such a sweet thing. She didn't need to offer that. And just to me, that just lifted my whole day. So praise God for that. Thank you. Yes, amen. That's awesome. Anyone else this morning? Okay, we will... Continue then with our opening hymn. Please join me. I don't know why I can't find anything in the bulletin today. Greater is he that is in me, number 525. <laughs> Let's sing it again. Greater is he. One of the unique songwriters of my generation wrote that, Andre Crouch. And it's, it's I didn't realize how prolific of a songwriter he was. Not only is he an accomplished songwriter, but a great musician also. But uh, would the uh, ushers come forward, please, and we'll receive our morning offering.
stand. Father, it is with great joy and privilege we come before you and return just a portion of what you've given to us. God, your great blessing upon us is not only the, the financial means that we have, but is our talent and God especially our time. But Father, I thank you most of all for the life that you've given to us today. The life that we have to live together, the life we have in the spirit, and the life, Father, that was purchased on Calvary for us. Thank you, Father. We ask your blessing upon these gifts, tithes, and offerings. And we ask that you would multiply them back in Jesus' name. And everyone said, Amen. Amen. Thank you. Be seated. We have any kids, so we'll go. I, I do the prayer things, right? Yeah, that's right. Okay. So we'll have uh, Drew. Don't get comfortable yet. We'll have him come around and pick up the prayer request. And sing something. 452 is what we'll sing while he does that. Let's go to prayer. Heavenly Father, we come to you as ones who have been called to be a part of your family, ones who have been redeemed by your son's blood, who have had their sins nailed to the cross and who have been resurrected, Lord, to live for you and to glorify you. Lord, we come to you with these prayer requests that we have written down. Lord, we have many requests, Lord, we have many ways in which we are dependent upon you. And Lord, we acknowledge this dependence upon you and ask that you would meet these needs that are in this box and also that are in our minds and our hearts that maybe we felt we couldn't even write it down on a piece of paper, Lord. But Lord, you know what we need, for Lord, you are our good Father. So we bring these prayer requests to you whether they be illnesses, whether they be financial things, whether they be emotional or psychological or whatever other kind of uh, needs that this sin world uh, makes us have need of. So, Lord, we ask that you would fulfill these things, again, in accordance of your will. And we pray all of this in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. For this reason, I kneel before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name. I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit 
in your inner being so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how high and long and wide and deep is the love of Christ and to know that this love that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask <clears throat> or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. And everyone said, Amen. Amen. This was taken from Paul's letter to the Ephesians, chapter 3, verses 14 through 21. Stand with me as we sing this, will you? Let's pray together. Father, truly, I thank you for the opportunity and the privilege you give to me. Lord, just a, an old sow's ear asking God today that you might speak through it. Lord, uh, uh, another Balaam's donkey standing before your people. May your Holy Spirit speak today, Father, not me. May your heart be seen today, not mine. And may each and every heart become fallow ground to receive the engrafted word of God. That we may grow, that we may trust, that we may have hope. Hope today in a day that is far lacking hope in our own society. Let us, Father, today be your blessing in Jesus' name. And everyone said? Amen. Please be seated. Our scripture comes today from Matthew chapter 6, verse 10. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. I'm going to zero in on your kingdom come. Who cares? Does anybody here really care God's kingdom comes or not? Many of us live with the expectation that it'll come someday. Are we not looking for that day? Oh, by the way, just so you know, don't freak out. We're live on Facebook. So anyone who asks you, may at some point see this again, not only when I post it to YouTube. I felt like Bill Gaither a few minutes ago. <laughs> taking every opportunity to advertise. But we live in a society today that is anticipating, especially the Christian folks, we're anticipating the coming kingdom of God, right? Well, the first petition of the Lord's Prayer was that God's name be hallowed. The second petition, your kingdom come, builds on the first by showing how God's name is hallowed in the world. God reveals his character and re reputation in his kingdom as his kingdom spreads 
to every corner of the world and as citizens of that kingdom do God's will on earth as it is in heaven. But what is God's kingdom? What is God's kingdom? Now, you and I may have the definition God's kingdom is where he finally comes, sets up court, throws all the bad people in jail, and lets all of us really good people go. I heard a term this morning that I I really was looking for the answer to it, and it will probably end up being a sermon. What is a good Christian? Think about that question. What is a good Christian? I'll just let you chew on that one for a while. First of all, a radical and revolutionary prayer is what we have in our hands as the Lord's Prayer. Few prayers become the mantra of society or are etched in public consciousness. The Lord's Prayer is one of those, but others, considerably more trite, have also become cultural artifacts. How about the serenity prayer? How many of you have ever prayed the serenity prayer? Really? Lord, grant me the serenity. Oh, you know how it goes? It says, Lord, grant me the serenity uh, to change the things I cannot change, to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. There's a great deal of controversy about who wrote it. Does it really matter to you who wrote it? Well, credit's given to Reinhold Niebuhr. The serenity prayer has enjoyed the spotlight since it was first brought up. It's been published, it's been printed, it's been put on books, it's been put on labels, it's been tattooed on people's every place you can imagine, and it's even been skywritten in the the sky. Lord, and it's been adopted by every self-help group there is. You say, well, but it's, it's really, really a good prayer. Well, I think Calvin and Hobbes may have uh, spoofed the prayer, but in the process may have hit the nail on the head. Listen to Calvin and Hobbes' version of it. Lord, grant me the strength to change what I can, the inability to accept what I can't, and the incapacity to know the difference. Thank you for somebody getting that. Because so often, we pray that prayer, and we just kind of go, in many ways, the serenity prayer is the model model prayer of the post-Christian era. It says nothing about the character of God, the plight of man, the need of redemption, the nature of the gospel. The serenity prayer is nothing more than a generic prayer for a people with generic religious beliefs. Now, if I make you upset with this sermon, please tell me afterwards. Don't tell everybody else. But if if talking about the serenity prayer upsets you, the rest of this sermon is going to really tick you off. Just so you know. The Lord's Prayer is doctrinally robust, theologically deep, and anything but serene. Anything, anything but serene. Regrettably, our familiarity with it has made it almost a rote thing that we do. How many of you learned it before you were in school? How many of you learned it in school? How many of your parents taught it to you at the table? We all know the prayer. Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. The kingdom come, the will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us not today. Right, right, right. right? Isn't that how we go through that prayer sometimes? And then we get to the end of it and we go, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Oh, well. It's just their daily bread. What's the sense of praying anyway if you already know what we need? 
Well, let's look at something a little deeper than that. You see, the Lord's Prayer is for revolutionaries. Is it, do we have any revolution? Is anybody here willing to go into revolution? I am. And I'm not talking just about bearing arms and going to war and all. I'm talking about the revolution that's going to change the world. There is a revolution going on. So what is the kingdom of God? One of the better descriptions comes from one of Andrew's favorite uh, theologians. It comes from Augustine, Bishop of, Bishop of Hippo. Have you ever seen him running around with a hippopotamus on his shirt? You can, all, you can all tell him today that the preacher, Pastor Bill, brought up his favorite theologian, Augustine of Hippo. In the 5th century, one of his developments was the two-kingdom system, or two-kingdom theology. One of the questions he raised was this. To what degree should the church care about world events, politics, or any of the world affairs? Building upon Jesus' teaching on uh, first and second greatest commandments, you know what they are, love the Lord thy God and love your neighbor as yourself, right? We know those as well as we know the Lord's Prayer, don't we? You see, Augustine suggested that the Christian must understand that there are two cities or two kingdoms in the world. The first city is the city of God. It's not God's because he lives there. It's God because his character has developed that city. You see, because his character and authority define it. There, God's sovereign authority is absolute and total. You say, well, it can't be on this earth because there's no absolute authority now. And if you listen to current events, there's no absolute anything other than absolute chaos in this world. You see, the one thing that I want you to understand is, is that God's kingdom is ordered according to rule and reign of God's law. We don't like that law, do we? We can't, we can't deal with the ten of them, let alone the three thousand of them that exist. Anybody broken the Ten Commandments this week? No, maybe not all of them. Christy, I'm glad you're here. Thank God for your protection when you're running. Good thing I wasn't running with you. We'd have tackled that car in the middle of the street. But where is God's grace? Thank God she wasn't hit. I don't know if any of you saw her post on Facebook. She almost got hit, her and Mike running. Some car purposefully tried to hit him, right? Where's God's rule there? Good question, isn't it? Good question. Where's God's rule? In the little baby that I sent out a prayer request, a, a girl lost one of her twins and then finally lost the other one today, uh, yesterday. Where's God's rule there? Isn't that your question? Haven't you had that question before? Where's God's rule in all the chaos that goes on? Christian, may I tell you something? We live in a kingdom of God that is present here but is not yet consummated. Oh, he's getting technical. By God's grace and power of the gospel, Paul indicated that we have already been made citizens of the city of God, Philippians 3.20. This citizenship is given to us by divine promise, but we do not yet see it. it is, we do not reside there yet. If you travel, Stella and I were in Lakeland University yesterday. Traveled through Racine and, was, and, and, and Sheboygan and Kenosha and all them little bitty towns in Wisconsin. And we're going through them and, man, they, it, it looks like a foreign land to me. We pulled off one place because there was a Dunkin' Donuts. Our daughter Mary wanted to get a free Dunkin' Donuts because yesterday was 
how can you all know what yesterday was when you don't know who Andrew or uh, Augustine of Hippo is? <laughs> just, just, just a small sideline. The thing that I want you to see is this. Jesus Christ is Lord and ultimately sovereign. Yet, he is also patient and allows human beings to exercise moral, I don't know if I put this line in your notes or not, moral responsibility. The gentleman that almost hit you has moral responsibility. The person that found your sunglasses and hasn't turned them in yet has moral responsibility. The person that picked up the $100 bill on the floor and put it in their pocket, has a moral responsibility. But because our options are our own, we do what is convenient for us. You see, the one thing is this. The city of man is temporary. The city of God is permanent. Romans 1 says, The city of man refuses to acknowledge its own creaturely and dependent status. Do you realize that the authorities of Plainfield, Illinois are in office because God said they could be in office? Do you realize that Bruce Rauner, I know I'm, I'm really getting people upset now, is governor because God said he could be? Do you realize that Donald Trump is the president? Okay, now I'm going to make you all mad. Because God said he could be. I don't care whether you're Republican or Democrat. I've told you that a thousand times. It doesn't matter to me. God is sovereign. And all things work together for the good of them that love God to those who are called according to his purpose. If you look at Romans chapter 7, it does exactly what it's supposed to do. Convict and condemn you of making, falling short of the glory of God. But thank God for Romans 8 that says, There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. And if you aren't in Christ Jesus, Romans 7 looms big behind you. The things that I should do, I don't do. The things that I shouldn't do, I do. And all those things put me in a doo-doo. But even as cute as that may sound, the last verse says, Who shall deliver me from such a death? I thank God through Jesus Christ my Lord. Recent evangelical uh, study in theology Respected writer George Eldon Ladd reinvigorated our understanding of uh, the kingdom. In scripture, the kingdom must be understood as something that is already here on earth, but not yet fully present. Ladies, when you were pregnant, you carried a baby. There were several weeks and maybe even a month or so that you didn't even know you were carrying a baby. And then all of a sudden you went, oh, I'm pregnant. And then all of a sudden you start, at, you know, taking care of yourself, stop drinking, stop eating, oh, all them kind of things. And then before long you know that you're doing this. And you know that you have a baby, but you, when we were having babies, you didn't know what it was. The lady came by and looked at you and said, oh, yeah, that's a boy. How does she know? No more than the doctors looking at them silly sonograms saying, oh, that's a boy. Tell that to Lindsay Carroll Casper. Showed us them, them pretty little pictures. Says, See, that's a boy. See? Uh, a lot they know. But here's, here's my point to all that. The kingdom is just like that baby inside of you. It's there, 
but it's not fully here yet. The kingdom of God is present with us, but it's not yet been consummated. It's not yet become something we can go to. Oh, is that why it says faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Lad and others of the generation pointed out a lot of great things about the kingdom of God. Essentially, the end of history, the eschatological, es that big word, of the Old Testament. The writers of the Old Testament envisioned a day when God would send the Messiah to triumph over Israel's enemies, establish the throne of David in righteousness, and throw all their enemies into the lake of fire. The kingdom arrived with the coming of Christ who urged all of his hearers to repent for what? The kingdom of God is at hand. He brought the kingdom to earth. Okay, don't get ahead of me yet. Colossians 1.13 says, God has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his dear Beloved son. We were in Lakeland University. We were in Sheboygan. We were in Milwaukee. But I wasn't a resident there. My citizenship rests down here in Plainfield. You see, I have a citizenship in the world, in the earth, but I also have a citizenship in heaven because I've been transferred from here to there. You say, no, you're not. I still see you. You're walking around on the earth. Hooray, hooray, hooray for you. But I want to tell you, I no longer am of this world. You say, yes, you are. I can see you. I can touch you. I can, I can hit you. I can make you hurt. I can make you cry. Yes, you can. But I want to tell you what. You can't change my mind. You see, the question still remains, what is the kingdom of God? The answer is found in the way that the Bible speaks of God's kingdom. It won't, it, in terms of creation, fall, redemption, and communication. Uh, a guy named Goldsworthy has defined the kingdom of God as God's people in God's place and God's rule and blessing. I like that definition. God's people in God's place under God's rule and blessing. Each of these features is present. You see, one of the things that's happened, and I, I'm, I'm going to, to try to give this to you carefully. Uh, each of these features is present in the earliest manifestation of God's kingdom in the Garden of Eden. God's people, who were they? Adam and Eve. God's place, where were they? God's rule and reign was where? There. And what would they get? What happened? What did they receive? Anything they wanted. But then, the fall. Okay? The fall completely disrupts the kingdom. You say, well, if it's God's kingdom, how could just one little thing, one little bite of one little apple do that? How could that affect this great, awesome God that's created everything? How could he do that? How could that happen? Well, it happened because of rebellion. You see, the fall completely disrupts the kingdom. Adam and Eve are exiled from the garden, from God's place. No longer able to enjoy God's blessing <laughs> because they rebelled against God's rule. How many of you have rules at home for your children? And every one of those children obeyed them to the letter, correct? We just spent about seven hours with our middle daughter. And let me tell you, even at that point, she doesn't obey everything I say. Boy, isn't that a surprise. Sometimes I wonder, God... Have you ever, somebody wrote a book years ago. God, are you up there? Was that Billy Graham wrote that? Somebody wrote that book. God, are you up there? 
Sometimes I ask that question. You? Yes, I do. I certainly do. You see, apart from redemption, rebellion is the state, the natural state of every man. Apart from rebellion, redemption, one or the other. Does that make sense, one or the other? Well, no, it doesn't, because I, I haven't really surrendered all to the Lord, but I'm not really as bad as, oh, now you're going to judge yourself by Bob Zirko. You're going to say, well, I, at least I don't do that. Or you're going to judge yourself by the preacher. I saw the preacher running 84 miles an hour yesterday. If you want proof of that, I've got it on my uh, phone where my phone tracker keeps track of how fast I drive. You know what it said to me when I got home yesterday? It said, Stella just completed a 118-mile drive because we stopped and then started again. A 118-mile drive and the fastest speed was 84 miles an hour. I looked at her and thought to myself, how could you drive so fast? You're a preacher's wife. Don't you know better than that? Oh, she wasn't driving. I was. Well, you're a preacher, don't you know? Yeah, I do. I know better than that. But the, the deal still remains. You see... One of the things that I want you to realize is that the kingdom is here just like it was in the very Garden of Eden. But we have the same power that Adam and Eve had. God did not leave this world in darkness, though. Aren't we glad? We are all born east of Eden, traitors to the crown, and living in what Paul calls the kingdom of darkness. But God did not leave us in darkness. In the work of redemption, God continued the work of building his kingdom on the earth. Thus, God called Abraham and his children Israel. And Israel said, yes, we'll follow you. We'll do what you want. And God said, great, here we go. Gave him ten rules. Couldn't keep the ten rules. Gave them order of the priesthood. Exactly, exactly what they were going to do. Haven't you ever said to, to, to someone or to God, if you just tell me what to do, I'd do it. If you just make it clear, I'll do it. How much clearer than this can you get? You say, oh, that's not very clear at all. Well, it may not be. But you never know how clear it is until you read it. As a result, God sent Israel into exile, just like he exiled Adam and Eve. Yet even during this judgment, the prophets always spoke of hope. The day when God would fully and finally bring his kingdom to earth. Jeremiah spoke of a day when God would inaugurate a new covenant, not a covenant written on stone, not ten rules, but a covenant written where? Can anybody tell me besides her? Anybody? In the heart. Oh, wow. In the heart he's going to write these rules. Anybody here have a conscience? Do you know when you've done wrong? You know what that is? It's God tapping me on the shoulder saying, I still love you. Because your kids go astray and do crazy, dumb, stupid, out of the world things, does that mean you don't love them? Absolutely not. And if you say you don't love them anymore, there's something desperately wrong with you. I told you this sermon was isn't one for tickling your ears today. Nowhere in Scripture is the hope 
inaugurated of God's kingdom painted any more clearly and, and vividly than the covenant in 2 Samuel 7, 18, 8 through 17. I'll read it. Now, therefore, thus you shall say to my servant David, thus says the Lord of hosts, I took you from the pasture, from following the sheep, to be ruler over my people Israel. I have been with you wherever you have gone and have cut off all your enemies from before you, and I will make you a great name, like the names of the great men who are on earth. I will also appoint a place for my people Israel and will plant them that they may live in their own place and not be disturbed again. Nor, nor will the wicked afflict them anymore as formerly, even from the day that I've commanded judges over my people, Israel. And I will give you rest from all your enemies. The Lord also declares that you, the Lord, will make that to you that the Lord will make a house for you when your days are complete and you lie down with your fathers. I will raise up your descendants after you who will come forth from you and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build the house for my name and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be the father to him and he will be my son to me. And when he commits iniquity, I will correct him and the rod of men and the strokes of the sons of men. But my loving kindness shall not depart from him. And as I, look at, as I took it away from Saul, whom I removed from before you, your house, your kingdom shall endure before me forever." Your throne shall be established forever. In the abundance with all those words and with all this vision, so Nathan spoke to David. A devatic promise. The passage points to the coming kingdom. That God will build. God promised that a descendant from David would have the kingdom. We, knew, we looked at Solomon and thought, surely Solomon is the one. What a goofy people we are to think that a guy that had 300 wives and 700 concubines was going to be the one to usher in the kingdom of God. Ultimately, the fulfillment of this text is in none other than Jesus Christ. That's why it's so important when we read the lineage of David into Jesus that we understand his kingdom is forever unchanged, unchallenged, universal, and reigning without end. Remember that Jesus came preaching the inauguration of the kingdom. His disciples were allowed to glimpse a little bit of the kingdom uh, in the glory during the transfiguration, Matthew 17, Mark 9. Jesus' work on the cross is the work of a king. Listen to this. When I put this down, I thought, God, this, this doesn't even sound right. The work of Jesus on the cross is actually the work of a king coming to redeem his people. Y'all have heard the stories before. The king sent his servant and they beat him up and sent him home. The king sent his strongest servant, they sent him out. Sent him home all bloodied up again. So finally the king said, listen, nobody will hurt my son. I'll send him. They killed him. So the picture of Jesus on the cross is not the picture of the, of the son dying. It's the picture of the father coming in place of every one of us who is Jesus. Who is this Jesus on the cross? None other than God Almighty. The king coming to pay the price for the redemption of man. Jesus came preaching the inauguration. You see, 
after his resurrection, Jesus declared that he had be, what he had been given, all authority in heaven and earth, Matthew 28, 18. The Great Commission is rooted in Christ's declaration that he is the king on the throne of all creation. In our current state stage in redemptive history, therefore, God's kingdom is made up of those who believe in Jesus Christ. God's people gathered in local churches, God's place under the law of Christ, the preaching and the new covenant of God's rule and blessing. Of course, we still wait for the day when the kingdom will be consummated. As of right now, the people of God are at war with spiritual darkness. We are to be carrying out the commission of making disciples of citizens of the kingdom. And of course, we can only do do so with great suffering and tribulation. Remember what Jesus said? I didn't like these words. I don't know if you thought they were just kind of glib words coming off his mouth to kind of scare people. But he said, in this life, in this world, you'll have tribulation. We Christians have been given, fed a bunch of crap because we believe that once we become a Christian, everything's going to be hunky-dory. Do you realize the moment you sign on the bottom line and say, I serve God, that you have declared war on the devil and he's declared war on you? Oh, believe me, I know people that have come to Christ and lived a perfect life and everything's been happy and never had a bump in the road. At least they tell me that. I don't necessarily believe it. You see, we still wait the completion of the Great Commission. What did he say? Go ye into all the world and preach this gospel to every creature and then, and then. And all of us electronic geniuses have thought we figured it out. Live on Facebook, YouTube, radio, television. Billy Graham preaching to billions of people at one time. My friends, Jesus said to us to go ye, not to go they. Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. We long for the day when we will no longer be the church militant, but we will become the church triumphant. I don't even think we're the church mediocre, let alone the church militant. It's time that the church got a fire lit under its blessed assurance so that we can get something boiling within us. I had a lady say to me out at the racetrack two events ago, She said, are you always this animated? I said, yes, ma'am, I am. I said, even when I make a covenant with myself to be very calm and collected like I did today, this whole side of the building is going to fall in. Everybody laughing over here. I said, yes, ma'am, I am. I've got a fire burning inside of me. You know how it is when you have a fever and you just have that that burning inside of you? According to scripture, how does the kingdom of God come from heaven? Many horribly wrong answers have been given. The liberals, let me me put the other word in front of it. Theological liberals, because I I certainly don't want to insult them with calling them liberals today. The theological liberals in the early 20th century uh, argued that the kingdom of God arrived by moral reform and social justice. We call that the social gospel. Make everybody happy. Paint a smile on everybody's face and everything will be hunky-dory. The theologically conservative 
have sometimes also erred in thinking that Christians can usher in the kingdom of God through political action and cultural influence. Well, I'll just go stand out here and be an influence. Is that like throwing a rock in the, the DuPage River and hoping it'll dam up the, the river? It doesn't take one of us. It takes us all. You see, the problem with this way of thinking, of course, is the fact that Jesus' kingdom is not of this world, John 18, 36. Political power, cultural influences are not unimportant, but they can never change the hearts of sinners, nor provide forgiveness of sin. Never. The Bible teaches that God's kingdom only comes in God's people's, when God's people preach God's word, which, uh, coupled with God's spirit, produces life and obedience. To use the language of Paul, God's word and spirit change the hearts of sinners such that they are rescued out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of his dear son, Colossians 1.13. As Philip Nikon said, the kingdom comes mainly through proclamation through the announcement that Jesus Christ, who was crucified, is now king. The only way people ever come into God's kingdom is by hearing his word and hearing his heralds proclaim the crucified Christ. By the foolishness of preaching, God has ordained that people be saved. Not through the fantastic music, not through the wonderful, beautiful building we have, not through the fantastic preacher that you have, not through any of the things that you think bless the kingdom. It's the foolishness of preaching and the preaching of the word of God, not the preaching of the doctrine of man. The lady at the track says, Boy, you must be awful to go to church to. I said, yeah, look at my church. <laughs> People don't want to hear. But until my last breath, I'll preach the word of God. If I have to stand on the street corner, just her and I will preach the word of God. Please remember, your kingdom come. In the first place it has to come is in you. We can't bring it to the earth, to the world, until it comes to us. In us, then through us. Father, truly, we have today a message to chew on. Thy kingdom come. Lord, when we look at next week, thy will be done or week after whenever I preach again. God, when we look at that, we sometimes think that your will is just whatever happens. Jesus prayed a petition specifically asking for you to bring your will. Father, I ask today that you take this word into our spirits and Father, that you today will fill us to overflowing with the power and the presence of the pure word of God so that we can honor you by being a part of the coming kingdom. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Would you stand with me as we sing our closing hymn? Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste. See the kingdom.
May the peace that passes all understanding abide with you. Father, I ask today that you would go with us, that we might be a light to shine in this world. In Jesus' name, and everyone said, amen.